Now, welcome to another inspiring edition of Sound Insight with Dr. Tom Curran. Good morning. Welcome to Sound Insight. This is Tom Curran, and I have the joy of my life, the delight of my life. Jesus is with me. <laughs> Got you, dear. Yes, you did. Oh, is that funny? <laughs> well, I thought this is getting kind of cheesy quick. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for not saying my name. Oh, awesome, Tom. That's my wonderful wife, Carrie, and she's with me on Faith and Family Fridays. So today I'm going to be talking with Carrie about a number of stories, and I know that you're going to be blessed by them. So please stay tuned. Welcome back to Sound Insight. Carrie, let's begin with a prayer. In the name of the, the Father, Father, and the Son, and the, and the Holy, Holy Spirit. Spirit. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, glorious, gracious God, we love you. We praise you. We thank you for the gift of marriage. We thank you for the gift of family. And Lord, we ask that today you would bless especially those who are discouraged, who are feeling a bit overwhelmed by their call as, as being a mother or being a father or being parents of a lot of kids. I also pray, Lord, for those who are discerning a call regarding the formation of their kids. I pray for those who are considering homeschooling or are on that path. I pray for those who are considering private schooling, Catholic schooling, or are on that path. And, and Lord, whatever the path is that they have for their kids, I pray, Lord, for blessings of wisdom and courage. They might know, know what to do and find the strength to do it. Mother Mary, St. Joseph, pray for us. Amen. In the name of the Father, Father and the and Son, Son, and the Holy, Holy Spirit. Spirit. Amen. Amen. Today we're going to cover several things. Uh, I want to get your insights, Kerry, on that wedding we went to last Saturday. So we're going to get there eventually. I want to talk about that. The fact that these, these families were both homeschooling families. And I know there are lots of listeners who are homeschoolers or who have maybe considered it or maybe at one point did it. And uh, there are others who are very firmly committed to Catholic schools. And so in our lives, when it comes to homeschooling or Catholic schooling, you know what our answer is? Yes. Yes. Carrie, yes. come on. You know, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you should know that by now. And sound inside. Anything never, that works. Anything that gets them to the goal line. It's never an either or. It's always a both and okay. on sound insight. So that's the paradox of faith. So... We're going to explore, I'm going to talk to you, Carrie, about some of the things that we've kept in mind as we have walked that journey with our nine children regarding how to best form and educate them. And it's involved public schools, it's involved Catholic schools, and it's involved homeschooling. So I'm excited to hear what you have to say about that. Uh, along the way, though, what we're going to begin with a Facebook post that came from a group that you were a part of. And... It has to do with large families, and, and sometimes moms can just be overwhelmed with being a mother of a lot of kids. So let's let's dive in. Let's start there. Sure, Tom. I think what resonated when I read it was I know being in this place, I've lived being in this place, and for many times I think I've come to you and said, why do I struggle so much? Why is this so hard? Why would God ask this of me when I feel like an ultimate failure so often? <laughs> <laughs> You're looking at me like, um, so this mother just wrote a simple post that those of large families, and even if you have a couple kids, you can relate to those moments where you feel overwhelmed. She says, I've been told many times it gets easier after five children. I'm preparing for baby number seven this weekend, and I'm not feeling it. Why do people say that? I have generic answers to people who wonder, quote, how do I do it? But the reality is I wake up and survive. Some days are better than others. Occasionally it's productive. But five or more children is really difficult. Being on the side, loving my children, of course. I'm not sure I'd recommend having a large family. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> So I just I hope her kids don't <laughs> read that. <laughs> well, I think, uh, you know, our kids know us inside and out and they know our struggles. So they, you know, we have to really preach the, the gifts of it all as well as the, you know, letting them see what's real. Well, let's start at the beginning. So here's this mom about to have her seventh child being told that after five, it gets easier. That's funny because I always say that six is the hardest that uh, when you have number six, especially when they're younger, it really has to do, I think, the ages. But if you have six kids that are under like 12 years old, that is I think really... it's six kids under eight oh, six is kids... where it's really hard. Well, I don't know if have that, but, that... but what, what once I... you have an eight-year-old to a 12-year-old, then you are starting to see the light. If they're helpful. Um, right? And most they of them to, are. Yeah, They have to turn the corner. If they want to eat. They need to be helpful. <laughs> Well, yes. and we're, we're jumping a little bit ahead here. Let me ask you that first question. What 
what's going on with her? You know, what's what can you relate to the mom who says this? Yeah, Tom, I think after we had maybe three, I remember to having this conversation with you and coming to this point where I was really trying to hold on to myself desires, my dreams, my goals. I wanted to travel. I still wanted to have some kind of like career outside the home. I really desired my space, like my bathroom, not to have kids into my makeup and go to mass without wrinkled clothes or things on me. And it was just this slow surrender, um, almost daily of this conversion of your life is not your own anymore. And I'm not exactly sure how many children we had at the time. But, Tom, I really knew that um, if I was going to live peacefully, I would have to embrace this cross. And it was a cross. (laughs) And I think that in society, us as moms and as women are told to not deny yourself those pleasures or not have to settle, quote unquote, settle for being with your children all day and letting them bother you. I'm not talking about not getting out and getting a break and all that. Believe me, I get my breaks. But it was more just this conversion of my mindset of how I saw my children. Did I really enjoy them? Did I celebrate with them? Did I did I like being with them? Or was it just this constant, I'm surviving and they're driving me crazy and I need... And so, you know, how do you balance that? So, and in, in use the word balance and I'm going to say... It's, it might have something to do with that concept of identity and fulfillment, that, y- that coming into marriage and, and before kids, a lot of uh, women are formed with this idea that fulfillment and fulfillment of your own sense of identity as a woman is going to principally be found in your career. And so when children come, there can be a sense of saying, oh, yeah, I, I want to be a mother too. Of course, I'm a mother. But I have kids, but I am, you know, whatever my name is. Mm -hmm. And and that comes to expression more fully in my career. So now I'm trying to juggle two fundamental uh, calls in my life or that sense of call that I have. Well, uh, Tom, I'll interrupt you there. I think, I mean, I never was this woman that wanted a career, even though I wanted to be a Catholic school principal. It's more even simpler than that is being home every day in the monotony of being (laughs) stuck with little kids or younger kids and not finding any fulfillment in that because it just feels like it's pointless or there's no purpose in changing all these diapers and constantly doing laundry and preparing food and just not being able to see it as a vocation that we are forming these little souls. And and to be honest, when you have little ones, you can actually coast. (laughs) I think I coasted for a few years because they just love you and they'll attend, you know, they just love mom and dad and there's nothing you can do wrong. But as I've looked back and now I have older girls, I can see how I missed some of those moments and those seasons of forming them more, more intentionally because I was just like, okay, just leave me alone for a while. I'm going to lock my door and go watch Oprah. (laughs) They are down watching, I don't know what they're watching, some show. I'm just saying these are struggles that a new mom might have. Does that make sense? I mean, it's a little bit different than the career. It's just the monotony of being home with little kids. Well, and, and again, you can think of, oh, come on now. They're so cute when they play with a toy or they're so cute when they roll over or they have all these firsts. Well, wouldn't that be just a delight Absolutely, I for think, 10 minutes? Well, no, right? and I think it takes eyes to see that. And I think that a lot of moms... And even I, we, I struggle with how I see. It's how, how do, what do I take for granted? Where's my gratitude? How do I see this as a blessing and not a burden? And I, I really feel like that's where moms need so much support. Well, and I think that some of it might be associated with this is a cross, right? And we can immediately think, well, this is a cross means this is a bad thing. Well, the cross is the path to our salvation. So I, I think one of the things that grew in you as you related it to me was this idea of being carrying the weight of so many kids and trying to have it all or trying to still not lose your sense of self that it reached a a kind of breaking point when we were able to see it with the eyes of faith and you would say to me because I wouldn't embrace this initially this is your path to holiness I'm like what are you talking about (laughs) then you would say this is how you are denying yourself these little pleasures of being able to have a meal without kids 
you know, taking food from you or having a warm meal or having a warm cup of coffee or, I mean, on and on and on. All these little pleasures, physical pleasures that you take for granted when you're single or when you're married without children that all of a sudden you're imposed upon by all these children. And it's like deny, deny, deny yourself. And it was, it is a constant pouring out and a constant giving over to Christ. But if you don't see it through those eyes, it could be a cross that is unbearable and no joy found in that. And I don't feel like God wants to, to you know, burden us with a cross that's unbearable. He wants us to find freedom and joy and life right in the midst of that cross. So it's how do you see that, right? Yeah. And fulfillment, our faith teaches us, comes from pouring our lives out as a gift, not as a duty, but as a gift when we freely give ourselves over, even to the point of self-sacrifice, right? Jesus is the one who's most supremely free, and he's free in the giving of his own life on the cross. He's free in the midst of his suffering, and it brings salvation to the whole world. So in our lives, that Jesus lives in us. I think that's a, that is hopefully a source of encouragement. So I think there's a, let's come back around to this woman who posts and says, I'm not sure I would recommend you know, a large families to someone who is talking to me, how would you speak to her now in the light of, of this? Do you have any? Because <laughs> I've come through the, <laughs> no, um, that's a good question. I love our family and I love this call and I feel like it is a vocation. Um, I feel like because I grew up in a large family as number 10 of 12 um, and I look at what God has given me, I am so blessed and so incredibly grateful that my mom and dad were open to nine at least. <laughs> or no, no, 10. ten. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, what number am I? To 10 at least. Um, and just the incredible fruit. But yes, it's a labor. It is work. It is sacrifice. It is pouring out. But it's a beautiful, incredibly. I can't, sometimes don't have words for just the, the immense joy I find in our family life. And I don't say, I'm not saying that you can't find that if you only have one or two children, but each child just, it just uh, unfolds this dynamic of relationships and interaction and communion that it just delights my heart. I don't even have to be in the, I mean, I just stand back and watch. Yeah. I like to think that the size of families on the one hand, it's the mystery of God and how God gives the gift of children. That's the first and foundational reality that there are some people who just aren't uh, aren't uh, able to have children. And, and there are other situations where children just don't come. But on the other hand, there is that sense of openness to life and openness to more children. And I think that that's one thing that is coming more to the forefront is larger families talking about the joys that come from being open to that generosity of, of openness, the generosity of welcoming. And that's not apart from the cross. I, I always like to say that no matter how many kids you have, it's full, it'll fill you to overflowing. Yes. You know, one child it will fill you to overflowing in terms of the acts of self-giving and, and pouring out your life. So it's, but there is that sense of, I don't know, exhaustion. <laughs> I was going to say exhaustion. That, exhilaration. <laughs> yeah. I, I meant to say exhilaration, but let's kind of put that out there. There is an exhaustion. No, it's just a associated. crazy amount of over of um, outpouring. But I have to say that um, God stretches moms and dads. I mean, we would never have been able to have nine after one and then have nine. It was like with each child, he was stretching us and stretching us and training us up and making more room for us to be more open. And I just feel like um, we've been stretched <laughs> and he's not done. I mean, I know there's a lot more um, being open. Uh, do you have news for me, dear? No. Is, is like a lot more. Is there something else that's happening here? <laughs> I didn't mean more children. I oh, meant okay. like more situations that we're going to face oh, when goodness. we have seven yeah. teenagers that yeah. it's going to be, you know, heavy crosses that we will walk with, you know, with our children. <sighs> Honey, now I got to go to I adoration. I hope they're not too heavy though. <laughs> I got to go to a lot more adoration here. And Carrie, one of the things that I think showed up, you talked about being stretched. Uh, our being stretched was very much connected to, I think, the families that we grew up in. I know that my dad and mom were models of pouring themselves out for their kids. Now, there were only five kids in my home, but my dad, he worked at some points three jobs. 
he worked three jobs so that his wife, my mother, could be home raising us kids. And it was a tremendous sacrifice for them. And then the ways that they gave things to us and, and provided opportunities for us. I think of sports, like the crazy schedule that we face these days. It mirrored in some ways. When they had five of us active in sports, it was crazy making. And so that's my story. But I'm here really, I want to learn more from you because you were number 10 of 12 and you grew up in a very distinct family with a mom and a dad that had very interesting personalities. <laughs> so Your dad's laughing in heaven, right? <laughs> it's like, gotcha. <laughs> you know, you think, oh, I was made for this. But when I look at my dad, I really don't feel like he had that personality or that disposition to say, yes, I love the chaos. I love the noise. I love all that. The family circus. All the, yeah. the hard work, the pouring out. But when I say, Tom, you and I are being stretched, I saw how much he was stretched. In a blog post, I wrote a letter to him because he had wrote a letter to us just before he had died. And I just, I'm just going to read two paragraphs because it says it better than if I just mumble. <laughs> it says, Dear Dad, um, when people find out I am the 10th of 12 children, they often ask about you and mom. As I talk about you, in my mind's eye, I see you with a contented smile. I can't believe I'm going to cry. Gently shaking your head as if in unbelief at your good fortune. I am blessed. Little did I realize that. Sorry. What it took for that sentence to be born in your heart and flow from your lips. Scripture describes how gold is purified of dross in a fiery furnace. I am blessed is pure gold. And our family life was your furnace. Only now, hey, do you want to read this? I want to read this, sir. <laughs> <It's very pathetic. laughs> okay. Yes, I don't want to be painful. Can you see it without your I glasses? Can, I'm going to hold it far <laughs> enough away from my eyes so I can see it. Yes. Only now, with nine children of my own and 20 years of marriage under my belt, do I appreciate what it meant for you to speak those three simple words, I am blessed. Being a mom to nine munchkins is exhausting. For you to be a dad of 12 kids with your temperament must have been crazy making. Organized, meticulous, clean, and frugal to an extreme, that was you. There is a place for everything and everything in its place. Trouble was, we kids knew those places too. Before you could blink an eye, voila, your wrench, calculator, razor, or gin disappeared, never to be seen again. You are the only person I know who not only had a to-do list, but a replace list. I wonder if any of us were ever on that second list. <laughs> so I just was saying that, you know, not necessarily is it our temperament to say, yes, I'm, I'm open, God, to what you have for me. But I feel like for my dad, it was a furnace. And it wasn't until after or during this time, I mean, he continued to be open to taking in foster children and unwed mothers. And he let street people stay with us. And he let people that didn't have a place to live stay with us for three weeks to a month. I mean, he was just very open to the crazy making of what my mom <laughs> purposed and felt called as a mission, but they were in unity. But what's so striking to me about this is that concept of the temperament, that there are certain inclinations, right? So you can imagine that there are inclinations to be open to a large family that are associated with like happy-go-lucky types of personalities that say, I'm fine with things being messy and all that. But that was not your dad. You know, having that sense of meticulous order and the budgeting of things. I, and I still remember his little notebook that he had, <laughs> right? Or even the way that I dislodged his morning routine. He's very routine, yeah. When I showed up for my visit with your brother Patrick, even though I was there to see you. The first morning I woke up, I was on East Coast time. I got there, uh, so I was up earlier than everybody, and I went to the front door, got the newspaper, went, I made some coffee, and I sat down uh, at the stool right at that little bar where your kitchen was, and I started reading the paper. These were like huge blunders. I had just stepped in a minefield three times. I know I had to come and say, Tom, what are you doing? You got his paper. <laughs> what are you reading the sport? That's my, because my dad did this every morning. He was very routine. 
And you can imagine how he experienced us taking or misplacing things that he liked. So when I struggle as a mother right now, I think of my dad and go, oh, wow, because I have my mom in me, too. So I can do a little crazy chaos and be organized. Well, let me read a couple more paragraphs from your okay. from your letter. Rather than, rather than good night, John boy, your bedtime message was shut off the lights, lock the front door and turn down the heat. That worked until your older kids returned home from their sporting events, prayer meetings, or parties and started banging around the cleaned up kitchen looking for food, cooking food, and of course, leaving the kitchen a complete mess. Those nights meant a detour on your morning routine of reading the just-delivered newspaper over fresh-brewed coffee. How could you possibly read the headlines or do your crossword puzzle in peace with the kitchen such a mess? So you rolled up your sleeves and dealt with it. The crossword puzzle could wait and would wait until order was restored. Did you say, I am blessed while scrubbing the frying pan? If you did, I want to know your secret. Really, I do. (laughs) And that many active kiddos meant broken windows, damaged appliances, and new stains on walls, carpets, and furniture. Accidents happened, and so did carelessness. In all of this, you somehow ran our household on a budget and balanced your checkbook to the penny. It must have been incredibly frustrating to account for all those unexpected expenses. Or did you expect them? Did you have a line item in our household budget for carelessness? I wouldn't be surprised. What does surprise and even amaze me was your openness to life in the midst of all this. Your regular detours from your morning routine never deterred you from a radical generosity when it came to children. God must have been so delighted in you. Dad, you were faithful, faithful to God, mom, and us children. And so after one child, you said yes again and 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 again. That was 12 agains, dear. I can't put my yeah. finger on when I first when I first noticed it, but I am blessed became your motto. Maybe it was when grandkids first showed up, or maybe it was when you realized you would never experience everything in its place. But that was okay because everything is a gift. I think that's what you meant when you said, I am blessed. All that comes from God is a blessing. So, um, and it goes on. Yeah. That was very, oh, wait a minute. Oh, sorry. <laughs> and a gift. And among God's blessings, you put us kids right there at the top of your list, along with your Catholic faith and mom. Well, I was, when you were reading that, Tom, uh, what struck me was. Those, I kept reading it so you could be I done know. crying. Oh, okay, so you. there you go. <laughs> um, you know, a lot of listeners have teenagers and college age students or kids that have not moved out and are still trying to figure out what their life's about. And. I keep thinking, oh, you know, my kids will turn 18 and move on or, you know, we'll slowly reach that retirement stage where I'll finally be able to wake up and not have to, you know, make breakfast for nine little ones and just be able to enjoy a coffee with you. But mom and dad were so happy to have us home for as long as we needed to be home. And we're so open. I mean, I think there were five or six of us living there in our 20s before we all got married. And we just hung out as family day in and day out. We did everything together and just really enjoyed being together. And none of us, unfortunately, were in a real hurry to to leave. But I know my mom and dad both said, well, we really don't need you to leave. We don't want you to leave. We enjoy you as children. They really enjoyed us as a family. And I know it just struck me when I just, yeah, was writing that, how as kids get older, I think there's a sense of go get up and move on and then we're going to retire. And I don't know, that was just not how it was with our family. So you, you focus in this um, blog post, this letter to your dad on that phrase, I am blessed. And it's a phrase that I remember your dad saying, I I only met him, you know, I mean, I only knew him for like the last 15 years of his life. And uh, that phrase was just regularly on his lips. And but he was in that stage where it was I mean he had a ton of grandkids and even a great grandkid, I think, by that time. But there was a sense of him having come through the fire. There was like a I've come through the furnace and the intensity of the crosses, of the burdens, of the daily 
pouring out in the detours <laughs> before he got <laughs> to his coffee were in his rear view mirror. And the ability to say, it's not like, he didn't say, I am blessed that that's done, thank God. Mm -hmm. But rather, I now see with a whole new level of clarity that all along, I have been blessed. Mm -hmm. I've been blessed through it all. Mm -hmm. That God is, blessed be God, thanks be to God for allowing me to say yes to him, even though, uh, you know, parts of us want to resist that full vocation or that call. I want to have it be a little bit more easy and I want to kind of do it my way and just to say, you know, this is hard and to be surrounded with others that will walk with us in this call as moms and dads is so important to be encouraged. And what was so beautiful, Tom, about this wedding that we went to on Saturday, you see that these two families have um, kind of finished this marathon and, and what do you daughter, mean by that, finishing a marathon? Well, you're raising your child. You've, they support out years of homeschooling. And homeschooling families, it is a lot of work. It is a lot of just self-donation, sacrifice. It, it's a real vocation. It's a call. Not everyone's called to homeschool, but those who do, it is an incredible call. And to see that they had you know, sacrificed for their children to go on to a private school and really made sacrifices financially for that to happen... And then um, their daughter finds this, uh, this incredible husband. And here are these two families see their children being joined. It's like they've kind of like finished this race, this marathon. And I just felt like they, they won because they said, yes, they're now off on their own. <laughs> I mean, of course, you know, there's still relationship and the difficulties they'll still share as, as um, family. But I don't know, it was just a beautiful moment for me to, I think that's, I, I was trying to, to name what I love about weddings. And there's so many things I do like about weddings from getting dressed up to, to the mass, to the, the beauty of this love just radiating. But I think what really struck me this time was seeing these two families finish this race of parenting and doing such a, just a real sacrificial kind of uh, walk for their kids and to see it come to this. It was just awesome. You know, I think of, it's kind of a famous story of a marathon runner named John Stephen Akari. Akari. He was a, um, he was a, in a runner from uh, Ethiopia, and he was at the 1968 Mexico City Olympics. And the story is that he started the, the marathon, but he got injured. And he got back up and, and he continued to run, but quickly fell far behind. And so the marathon finished, the, the race ended. And in fact, uh, the crowds left and the organizers were packing everything up. And, and all of a sudden he comes into the stadium to do his final lap around. And the people that were there stopped and they started to cheer as he made his final lap around and, and he crossed the finish line. And a reporter came up to him and said, you know, look at you, you're limping and you're bleeding and you're injured and what are you doing? And he said, my country did not send me 5,000 miles to start this race. My country sent me here to finish this race. And wow. for me, that's a beautiful, like I, in a certain sense, parable for sometimes what it takes for us as parents. God didn't <laughs> make us parents of kids to start a race, but he wants, he wants them and us to finish that race. Even when we get crippled, <laughs> even when yeah, we get even with injured our children and we trip and fall. Don't choose faith when they don't choose Christ, when they don't, when, you know, they make choices that are out of our control and we say, Lord, we and are And they don't look done. like winners of any race that we had in mind for them. Mm -hmm. God's still faithful. God's still going to run with us. God's going to give us the grace we need. Carrie, when we come back, I want to dive into that concept of pouring yourself out when it comes to the education and formation of your kids and move into that concept of homeschooling, Catholic school, public school, and how we've navigated those waters. Welcome back to Sound Insight. It is such a joy to be with you today. I'm with uh, my wife, Carrie, and we're talking about some of the pouring out that's involved in being a, a parent, and in particular, being a mother. I know that a number of our listeners have considered homeschooling or have done homeschooling or maybe had a hybrid in it that involved homeschooling or maybe they've, they've moved on from it. And 
there's the, there's certain considerations to keep in mind. There are blessings and benefits and, and some of the other things that are difficult and maybe some of those added crosses that we're talking about. But then Catholic school is also such a wonderful option and, and something that I know has been in a part of our lives for years. Public schools are also there as an option as well. And so we know wonderful Catholic families that have their kids in public schools and have made that choice. And so I want to navigate some of that with you today, Kerry, because you yourself, for those who don't know, um, talk a little bit about your own background, Kerry, when it comes to education. Sure. Well, I taught for many years, so I love teaching. I love So you have a degree in education, and then you have a master's degree (laughs) in educational leadership, and you have a certification to teach in resource rooms. Yes. Okay. And so we started with public school, um, kindergarten, first grade. I went in and visited the school. It was a great, fine public school. Um, I knew the teachers there, great teachers. I mean, some of the best teachers are in public schools. And um, I just thought there was so much more for our daughter than what she was getting and she was bright so it made it a natural option I think kids that fall on either end of the spectrum if they're really bright or they struggle and they have disabilities um, homeschooling is a great option if the parent feels that call so for us at that time I was like oh she's very far ahead of these kids and they just she was sitting around a lot and um, not getting the fullness of what I thought academically as she needed. However, Tom, what I really came to learn as we started homeschooling, it wasn't just about academics. It was so much more about the formation of the heart and the mind and the soul. It was so much more about the formation of the family. It was so much more just family togetherness and the sense of being on a mission and close knit. And it wasn't like we were trying to protect her. We just wanted her to flourish and Anne Marie, our second daughter as well, and just be all they could be. And we just felt like there were limits to what the public school had to offer. And I could do it so much better and uh, more efficiently. <laughs> and we could be together as a family. Um, That's one of the things that uh, when I talk to homeschoolers, it's, it's almost like universally proclaimed that when you homeschool, you're able to get so much more done in a shorter amount of time. That the time can be used very efficiently because it's focusing on one child and that child's aptitude and abilities. So you can move at the pace of your child. Yeah. And then when we homeschooled Tom, something we did, which is, I know this from the power of being in the classroom and being a teacher of of kids. I saw how children talked and and treated their parents versus how they would talk and treat me as their teacher. And they would do things for me and work for me in a way that their parents could not get them to do and work for, um, they would not work for their parents in the same way. So I realized um, early on that to motivate my children and to get them to finish work. And cause that's the, the struggle is all of a sudden I'm mom and I'm the teacher and I'm the, you know, the chore master and I'm and the, the principal, principal and the dean of discipline <laughs> in the cafeteria work. I was doing everything. And so you're with them all day long. And so it's, how do you keep that fresh? How do you keep that relationship? Um, just in, in strong because it's so easy to fall into bad homeschooling practices. Right. Um, and right now we have seven kids that are school age. We have five kids currently in Catholic schools and our other two school age kids are being homeschooled. And then we have two that are preschool uh, aged. Yeah. So what we did was we joined with three other families and homeschooled for two years and we'd meet twice a week at one of the homes and we just broke up the curriculum different moms felt strong in different areas one was a science studied science one was a nurse one loved history um, the dad would come in and teach these great history lessons they're from Virginia just passionate about Civil War Revolutionary War and um, I loved anything crafty <laughs> anything with literature And it was fantastic because all these kids that were not my own would work for me and I could get them to do things that the moms just could not motivate them to do. And it's just a natural thing that happens in homeschooling situations is, see, it was easy to teach a first and second grader, a kindergarten, second grader, but when they get to fifth, sixth, seventh grade, the curriculum gets more intense. The level of learning increases and the level of, I need my autonomy, my space from my family. I feel like, you know, then that's when you have to, okay, what are we going to do now? Or how is this going to change? I mean, literally talk. Um, every year we reassess our kids and say, okay, where are we? And it's not like we're changing it up every year, but we just tweak things slightly to just really fit your child, know your child, know their strengths, know their aptitude, know their ability, 
And um, I think in your heart's desire, you will find a, a path forward that is best for them and for your family. Well, I know one of the things, like there was also just some pragmatism, like kindergarten and first grade in the public school, or at least the kindergarten, was attractive to us because it was free and they had a bus. <laughs> 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 it's very pragmatic. So it's like, well, let the kids learn their alphabet. Let them learn how to socialize with other kids. Let them learn in a, a schooling environment that's not challenging and that mm-hmm. doesn't cost money. This is not a bad thing. Very pragmatic thinking. But uh, when we were doing homeschooling, and at, at one point we had all of our ho- school age kids homeschooled, uh, I think one of the things that we found was that you had less time you were more divided when it came to really attending to the next four little ones that we had so you had three i think being homeschooled and then four that were you know just right after them like four three two one well full disclosure i was not open to homeschooling (laughs) certain personalities in our home i mean not everyone flourishes with mom all day long and Mm -hmm. so it made sense to, op- to just try the private school. Um, we did have a mommy's helper because it was just nearly impossible to homeschool well and run a home with that many kids and that many little ones. I don't know how moms do it. I know they do it. And I, you know, they're the ones saying, oh, this cross is too heavy. <laughs> but we, we had someone just come in and help us a few days a week. That was our investment in education. It was we couldn't have done it without that. Well, and I just say that, I mean, you know, we could go on and on about the, yeah. the blessings and benefits of homeschooling, everything from you have the freedom to be able to make it to mass. You, when you're co-oping with other families of faith, you have your kids um, around other kids that have a shared vision of life and some common values with the other families. So those are great enrichments to your kids. So in terms of, you know, their being polite and other types types of character and virtue formation gets brought right in. You know, those are tremendous blessings of, of homeschooling that we found, as well as um, the ability to uh, really discern. Like in our instance, it was like, you know what, we want this particular one to be home right now in order to be able to build a relationship or help her to face a challenge or to help her excel in an, an area that is just not going to be able to happen, not nearly yes. in that way. And so that's that's how we've done it. Yes, that's in right time. A couple of kids just weren't reading, like weren't in love with reading and literature. And so I said, let's, and we had a newborn. I was like, do you want to stay home? No, my my friends would miss me too much. I love school too much. I was like, okay, a couple months pass. And then she's like, okay, I want to stay home. I want to be with the newborn. I want, and so great, let's just stay home for five months. And if you want to go back, you can. But we just left it open. And that was Anne-Marie. And she just grew in this passion for reading and in relationship with her little three little sisters. Is that right? There are three at home at the time. And it was just the best, best thing for us and for her at that time. And a few years go by, then another one wants to stay home. And her passion for reading increased. And I mean, it was just, yes, Tom, you have to really look at the whole family. And it wasn't like we thought the private school was better or the homeschooling was better. It was just really what is God calling us to and trying to respond. Because I know all families out there, all parents out there want the best for their kids. They really want them to flourish wherever they are. It's just you're not always able to do whatever, however. And it's like, God, meet us where we're at. Um, and then one thing about the, the public school is our girls did gymnastics at the middle school. I pick them up from the private school, brought them over every day. And when you say private school, you mean Catholic school. Yes, it's our parish Catholic, school. yeah. yeah. Um, and it was a fantastic experience. They met some great girls. The The coaches from this middle school were just so, just so cool. And I really liked all these, um, there's like six coaches they had. And the program was phenomenal and it was super, super inexpensive. <laughs> So, Carrie, when you think about the blessings that have come to our family and our kids through participating in a Catholic school, what are some of the things that jump out at you? Well, I would say the academics have been a real blessing. Um, Some of our kids that are a little bit brighter have really excelled and been challenged and really grown in that way. Um, I think just friendships that they've developed uh, of course, the sense of faith that they start all the classes with prayer, that in the hallways you see prayers, you see the saints, you see Mary, you see the cru- crucifix. It's just a full 
experience of the Catholic faith. Um, that's, you know, you get it to different degrees depending on where you're at, what school you're at, what diocese you're in, because I've heard different stories from all over the country about how they grow kids in faith. Um, but just talking about faith, talking to their their when the kids' friends come over and we just can pray a rosary with them, they know that we're a family of faith and this is this is who we are, and they know I, that identity. What I like about a Catholic school is that it takes <laughs> something that in the wider culture is devoid of faith as its context, and it's imbued it. It's made it the atmosphere. In other words, our kids growing up the way that they are are recognizing that faith is part of how they see life, how they see everything in their lives. And that atmosphere of faith, for me, is one of the greatest blessings that comes from a Catholic school. I know that, or it seems to me, that some families are there for the sake of, let's say, protecting their kids from the dangers of public schools, or liking the discipline they know they're going to get for their kids, or... In other words, the, 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 the concept of having a rich Catholic experience is not high on their list. At least it's, it comes across that way. Maybe because it's, I don't see them come across the path of the church very often. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I, I think for me that uh, it's, for us, it's just the opposite. It's the more that the school emphasizes Christ as the center for all that they're doing with regular celebration of mass as a school community or as a class, and with reconciliation, celebration and of praying confession, the rosary and praying yes. the rosary, Retreats. feast days. Yes. Yeah, like yesterday was the eighth, eighth graders. They were on retreat together. Wow, yeah. what a beautiful thing, right? For the kids to have that experience. Mm -hmm. That for you know we want the supernatural to be natural. That's why I love Catholic schools. Is that it? Really, it takes the the realm of the supernatural of God and, and, and faith and beyond the world, and it makes it part and parcel of their day-to-day -day lives. Yeah, and I think the atmosphere that I noticed that was different in the Catholic school versus being in the public school, and these are good public schools, um, was just the expectations all around and the tightness of which they were monitored and encouraged and pushed forward was more vigilant and more present in the private school. So there is not a lot of room to just kind of coast by or get by or be mediocre. The Catholic school really expects more from our kids than I experienced in the public school. But um, it's not to say that there aren't teachers out there or schools out there that don't expect a lot. You can have really great teachers in a private school and really bad teachers in a private school, Catholic school. And same with the public school. So it's, again, it's just really saying where are we at this season in our life and how do we discern what's best for that child or for the situation? So Carrie, I want to ask you, <laughs> when you think about the time that is most crucial or critical, like let's say a family has budgetary considerations and they're like, you know, it's going to be difficult for us to have our kids be in Catholic schools for the entirety of their educational life. Would you consider the early years to be the most important in terms of if we can invest, we'll invest early. Or would you consider high school, those years, as being the, the most critical as helping to establish the, the footholds, the foundations uh, for the kids' lives? Wow, Tom, that's a, that's a loaded question. Um, Just say the answer is yes. Yes, both. <laughs> uh, well, the kids are so open at a younger age to be formed and to be um, shepherded. This is a delicate, tender year. And just the time that we spend together in conversations and in laughing at each other and delighting in the little new babies. And I mean, it's just such a precious time that it's hard for me to send them to any school. I want them home with me because it's so sweet and it goes so fast. So if I guess I had to choose, I would homeschool them <laughs> <laughs> Tell they're like fourth grade, and then when the curriculum gets more tricky, I would find a really good public school if I couldn't afford a Catholic school. I think they can't go into a high school without having a sense of connectedness. So it's either through sports or through clubs or through musical instrument. Or it's easier if they do. Yeah, it's not just, that they can't. Yeah, it's well, just, it's just hard if you just put a child into the Catholic school as a ninth grader and they really 
have not slowly immersed right. themselves into it. Rela- well, they have to have relationships that are already formed. So I think parents would have to be aware of, okay, where's the teams for the different schools that feed into this Catholic school? Because socializing in that time is so important. And if they don't make connections, um, it's just really going to be a struggle for a season. Now, some kids are very social and it's not a big deal. They'll just go in the first day and be best friends with everyone by the second semester. But I think private school in the high school years is so critical with what kids are facing in high school this day. I don't feel like your kids can go to a high, public high school and get lost necessarily because you as a parent and as a family know, you know, you know your values and you know the traditions in which you've raised them. But I just feel um, it's easier in the high school years to stray. Now, well, college is a, we're not there yet, so it's a whole <laughs> different, <laughs> that's a whole different ball of wax that we've yet to unco- unfold. The parents that I'm, I really stand in like strong admiration of are those that can homeschool their kids well through high school. You know, I have a hard enough time keeping up with my daughter in her math class, and she's just a freshman in high school, and I've taken a lot of math. You know, weren't so, you like an engineer major? Let's or not talk about all that stuff. <laughs> but I took a lot of advanced math in my college years, <laughs> and I'm struggling to to recover that, helping my daughter with her, you know, algebra two. So it's only going to get harder. So I'm like, man, I got to brush up on this stuff if I'm really going to be of uh, of support to her. But parents who are doing this stuff um, without um, you know, maybe without that kind of background, it's it can be a challenge to to make sure that your kids are advancing. But they do it. And, well, it's they, doable. Can, it, I mean, if you're called to homeschool through high school, it is doable. And there are so many great internet programs out there and support groups out there. Um, it's just something that I don't think some of our kids would uh, let us do to them, so to speak. Not that we're not the parents, <laughs> but they really have great friendships, and they really are looking forward to that going to that school. Well, and and so just as a way of kind of wrapping up here, because we're running out of time, is that, uh, you know, if you can find a Catholic school or the right high school for your child, it's, you know, how do I help my child flourish? It's know that child, know what their gifts are, and then how do you help set them up for success through their friendships? Because that's so critical in the high school years, no matter if it's a public school or a Catholic school, right? It's not that Catholic school don't have kids that are, doesn't have kids that are going to move in a bad direction or take your kids on that path. So really, it's it's build keeping that strong relationship, really investing in those relationships with our kids, no matter public school, home school, or uh, or Catholic high school, private school. So, well, Carrie, I want to end with a final paragraph from your letter to your dad. Oh, the letter to my dad. Okay, it says, um, I have firm hope you are in heaven, looking down lovingly upon me and my crew. With you are the little ones I will meet one day and the family members who have gone before me. While you left behind the struggles and burdens involved in being our dad, I know there is one thing you took with you, your motto, which you will sing for ages unending. I am blessed. I can't wait to join you. Until then, Dad, just know I am blessed. Carrie. Thank you so much. Hey, God bless your weekend. Join us on Monday for more Sound Insight.